Amen, amen. You guys can you please take a seat. I'm grateful for, for that time to get to, to worship with you and, and just declare that just the, the praises and the truths of Scripture through song. Well, we've been in, in this series for a few weeks now. We call it the five solas. Uh, really came out. Uh, we're not going to go back through the, the, the history of, of, of where this, this particularly comes from, but really comes out of the, the Protestant Reformation. There was uh, a time when the church was just kind of straying and, and um, going away from really what the Word of God just foundationally says and the truth. Uh, and, and a product of that, as they said, man, we can disagree about a lot of different things, but here's five things that we got to make sure that we uh, agree on. And, and we summarize them by, by this statement is that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to Scripture alone, for the glory of God alone. Uh, the last two weeks, we kind of focused on these first two that were saved by grace alone, through faith alone. Um, and, and this week, the most important week, uh, I, I may have said that every week, but, but I really mean it this way, the most important week of, of this aspect of in Christ alone. And so that's what we're really going to be digging into and our, our, our starting text that we've been uh, Going to, for all of these sermons, Ephesians chapter 2, that's where we're going to be uh, here in just a moment. But as I was preparing this, I was, I was thinking about, man, how, how funny and how, how different, man, man, language is. And I'm not just talking like, like uh, from English to Chinese. Like, uh, I'm talking about how different English can be just in different regions of the country. Uh, I'm pretty sure all of you know that me and my wife are originally from Alabama, uh, and so our English is different than West Coast English, right? There, there's things that, that we say that you would have no idea what we're talking about. For example, I'm going to pick on my wife. She's not in here. Um, but a few weeks ago, uh, she was at work, and uh, she, uh, she's in management, and there, there's two other people she works very closely with. And, and she comes into work one day, and one of the doctor's children um, was was in the conference room. This is very uncharacteristic. Uh, my wife's a, a nurse. And so my wife goes and says, hey, uh, why does Dr. So-and-so have their kid on a pallet in the conference room? And the other two individuals, look of concern, uh, went through the roof. They're like, why, why would they ever put this kid on, on a pallet? What, what are you talking about? Like, this sounds like torture uh, is, is the, the only thing that they had in mind. And the, the reason, some of you are, are, are confused by this. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, where I come from, a pallet can absolutely mean a, a wooden uh, platform that you ship stuff on. Uh, that, that's probably the most common form. That's probably maybe where most of your minds went when I said pallet. But what pallet can also mean is uh, like when I was sick as a kid and I, I was going to sleep in my parents' bedroom, uh, I didn't sleep in the bed with them, they would make a, a, what we would call a pallet on the floor. It would be, you'd put thick blankets down and you sleep on top of that. Uh, I guess we were just too poor for air mattresses. And so we, we had what we call pallets, uh, makeshift uh, bed out of blankets. Uh, and that was just a, an incredibly common term where we're from. Uh, has anybody in the room ever heard of pallet in that sense before? A couple of us, okay, okay, most of us not, uh, right? Most of you were, were like my, my wife's coworkers thinking that, uh, that her boss has uh, strapped somebody to this wooden thing in the floor, uh, right? It, it, it's funny how, how different, right, cultures can, can influence language and, and, and circumstances, and, and that's just even within the English language, even in the same time period. And it's funny to me that we, we don't consider that very often, that cultures and nuances and words could have been so different 2,000 years ago in a context where uh, most individuals couldn't read, in a context where, where, where most families, several generations, lived in one household, a very collectivist, we're very individualistic in a very collectivist culture. And it's funny to me that, that, that we, we could be so prone to, to think, man, man, what they said would, would mean the exact same thing uh, for them as it meant for, like for us today. And so we're going to look at one of those things today is that, man, sometimes in the, in the writing uh, of the Bible, they wrote things in such a way because they, they, were, they were playing on and trusting a common knowledge. They, they were saying, hey, pallet, and, and trusting that they knew what the, the uh, readers were talking about. 
And so we're going to look at one of those instances today that, that God really just kind of illuminated to me in this past week that I think is just so cool. Uh, and so, so get ready for that. But we're going to start foundationally Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, two starting in verse 4. Uh, but God, uh, it's, it's difficult to ever start with a conjunction. Uh, remember verses 1 through 3 uh, is really Paul telling you how terrible you really are. All right, starts out, says, hey, you are dead in your trespassing and sins. You can't be more dead than anybody else. It says, hey, as good as you think you are, you're way worse than that. Uh, but thankfully, it doesn't stop with that. It, start, it, it continues with this verse. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love of which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Over and over again, it gives the, the absolute emphasis of saying, hey, everything that we're talking about is centered on and focused on Christ Jesus. And it leads us to the, the first point this morning that, that is going to sound like it un, undoes the, the, undoes the, the whole sermon from last week. Because uh, the, the, the whole sermon from last week, we talked about, man, faith alone is, is, is the power of salvation, right? Faith is, is what we have to have. Well, it's not us trying to do a lot of things for God. It's not faith in Jesus plus baptism or faith in Jesus plus communion or, or faith in Jesus and, and trying to work really hard for him. It's faith alone that saved us. But here, here's our first point this morning, is that faith alone is useless. Faith alone is useless. As I was like just really spending time with this text and spending time with, with that sola of solus Christus, which, which means Christ alone, that, that we're uh, digging into this morning. I really began to, 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 to dive in, because like, we looked so much about faith last week. And I really began to realize that, man, so many of us have faith in something. Well, we, we gave the example, there's kind of three elements of faith. First uh, element of faith is knowledge. And give the, the example of a chair. Uh, this is often uh, used as an example for faith. But the, the, the first part of, of if I was going to have faith in this chair, the first one is I'd have to know the chair even exists, right? I'd have to know a chair is there for me to trust, for me to have faith in it. All right, so that's the first step, knowledge. We've got to have knowledge about Jesus. We can't put our faith in, in Jesus or we can't put our faith in something that we don't even know exists. Right, so that's, that's the first baseline is, is knowledge about it. The second is we have to, I have to believe that this chair is capable of holding me up. Right, I had to have seen it, uh, some, it hold somebody else up, maybe of, of equal size, right? Because there's, there's some chairs out there that I don't believe could hold me up, right? I'm not, I'm not testing those, but, but I got to believe that, that, that it's capable. Right? You got to believe that Jesus is who he says that he is. You got to believe that, that Jesus is able to do what he said he did. But that's not enough. Right? The scripture says, hey, even the demons believe. Right? Even the demons shuddered at Jesus because they knew what he was capable of. Faith then takes it the next step. We get we knowledge of it, we have belief in it, but then it's the, the complete trust in the chair. The complete trust in Jesus. Say, man, no, no, no. It's no longer me and what I can do, what I'm capable of. I not only know who Jesus is, I believe what he's capable of doing, but I'm going to completely surrender my entire life to that. Some of you were hoping this chair would fail me. Uh, um, I forgive you for that. But no, um, so, so that, that's the, the, the essence of faith, right? You've got to have knowledge of something, belief that it's able to do what it uh, says it's able to do. And then lastly, you've got to put your trust in that. And with that kind of basis of a definition, man, the reality is there's, there's a lot of things in our life that we put our faith in. I'll just tell you some of the things that I'm guilty of putting my faith in. I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of putting my faith in finances. 
right? I, I, I believe that they're what's going to take care of me, what's going to provide for me more than anything else. And, and it's like, uh, Lord, I, I, I'm not going to trust in you to take care of me. Lord, I just need to trust in my financial decisions. Some of us put, put faith in our family of, of, of maybe it's like, man, I, I know times are going to get tough, but I know I can always count on my family to always be there and be everything that I need. Put faith in, in your kids or faith in, in, in futures. Like, man, things may stink right now, but I, I'm just going to trust that things are going to get better in the future, and that's what I'm going to put my faith in and, and trust in that. There's a lot of people that believe in a lot of different uh, religions all around the world. And there's a lot of people that put a lot of faith in a lot of different things. But faith alone is useless. Uh, what's most important is the direction, the thing that you're putting your faith in. Because there is only one thing in all of existence uh, that, that not only that you can have knowledge about, believe in, but that when you put your trust in, it won't fail you. And that is Jesus and Jesus alone. Our faith must be in Jesus alone. The second point this morning, our faith must be in Jesus alone. As soon as we try to, to, to add on anything else to that, Jesus said, hey, I'm out the picture. You're saying, Jesus, I put my faith in you. I, I, I trust in you, but, but man, I, I still need to, to, to carry some weight on myself. I, need, I still need to tr trust in myself a little bit. Lord, Lord, I trust you, but I still need to trust in, in my finances a little bit. And Jesus is calling us. He's saying, no, 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 no. You need all of me. As soon as you try to add anything else, we mess it up. Our faith must be in Jesus alone. If you don't believe me, let's, I'm going to take you to two passages real quick. Acts chapter 4. Peter is talking here and it says, hey, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must say, be saved. Peter says, hey, I want to be abundantly clear that there is no other option than Jesus and Jesus alone. I've heard it said, man, that there is a lot of ways to Jesus, but there is only one way to a right relationship with God, and that's through Jesus. It's faith, and it's, it's useless by itself, but, but faith in Jesus and Jesus alone is the power of salvation. If this isn't enough, let me just give you the words of Jesus. When he says in, in John 14, he says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And what I love, we were talking about kind of the difference in language. This word no one uh, in, in the Greek means no one, like not a single person. There's no other option. And I don't know if, how Jesus could have been any more clear than to say, hey, uh, it, it's me or nothing else. And I want to show you a, a kind of a, a story that, that we're going to kind of tra tra traverse. I don't know why that word was so hard for me. We're going to traverse uh, uh, some different areas of Scripture that, that kind of really goes back to that idea that we talked about earlier. That, that man, there was things written in the Bible particularly in the book of Matthew, because Matthew knew his audience. Did you know, like, Matthew wasn't primarily writing to uh, 21st century uh, Western English-speaking Christians. Matthew's primary audience, like, while he's writing this, he, he has in mind uh, present-day Jews, first century Jews is who he has in mind. And so when you're writing to an audience like that, you're going to, to believe that they have a foundational understanding of a few different things. Right, they, they understand Jewish culture and, and experiences and, and feasts and, and customs, things that, that we wouldn't necessarily understand in the same way. So when he's writing to that, that audience, uh, man, we have to put ourselves in those shoes to, to understand some things that Matthew really wanted us to understand. And man, God, when I was spending time with, with him in, in my God time this past week, God's time is just 
personal time, you alone with the Lord. What, what mine looks like is I usually listen to a song. I have an app that, that, that I pray through the scripture. It, it kind of guides me uh, through scripture to pray through. I read uh, a few chapters of the Bible. I journal a little bit. I listen to a commentary on that. I pray specifically for things in my life, and then I work on scripture memory. That's my, that's my time alone with the Lord. And something I really try to do is make sure that is not sermon prep time for me. For, for pastors, it can be easy to, uh, to just always be thinking about the Bible in terms of how I'm going to present it to somebody else. And, and I, I believe that God, like this week in particular, has even said, no, no, I want something for you, not for your congregation. But in, in this moment, this past Wednesday, I believe I just got to see something in the text and just so clearly that I'd never seen before that, that I, I, I got to give it to somebody else. I got to give it to you. All right, so in Matthew chapter 14, Matthew chapter 14, again, Matthew was a Jew writing to Jews. And when I first read this text, it's only three verses long of this little snippet of a story. And when I first read it, I said, why would they even include this story in there? It seemed somewhat pointless. But let's read it together. Matthew 14. It says, and when they had crossed over, they came to the land at uh, Gennesaret. Give you a little bit of context of what's going on in Matthew 14. Uh, at the beginning of Matthew 14, John the Baptist is beheaded. The cousin of Jesus, man, you can imagine the sorrow that's felt with that. What also happened in Matthew 14, this is the first miraculous feeding of the 5,000. And then a, a, a little bit later, Jesus has told his disciples, hey, take this boat and go across, and I'm going to meet you later. And this is the, the, the moment where Jesus walks on water. The disciples call out to him, and, and Jesus uh, joins them. And so when they finally make it to the other side, this is where the story picks up. These quick three verses. All right, so that's verse, and when they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret. Verse 35, it says, and when the men of that place recognized him. They sent around to all that region and brought him all who were sick and implored him that they may only touch the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. And then the story continues and, and, and this place isn't mentioned again. But man, this passage just struck me this week in just a new and fresh way. Because originally in Matthew chapter 9, we, we get this story of, of a woman that, that has uh, had this blood disease for years. And she reaches out and she touches the tassel, the fringe of Jesus' robe. And she's healed. And I thought that was the only time it happened. And then now we have this, this separate event of these people coming to Jesus and saying, man, I just want to touch his fringe. And I was like, why? That doesn't make a ton of sense to me. And here's why I really believe Matthew includes this story in the Bible because of who he's writing to. The, the people that would have read this in the first century would immediately, when they read this, immediately thought about Numbers 15. I know that's all where your minds went, right? You, you started thinking about Numbers 15. Because Jews in this day had the Torah. The Torah is the first five books of the Bible. They had it memorized. Now, I know it's difficult for most of us to even read through those books, uh, much less have, have it memorized, right? So, so we'll just say, hey, they were more studious than us. Numbers 15, let me share with you what it says. It says, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the people of Israel and tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and to put a cord of blue on the tassel of each corner and it shall be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments of the Lord. To do them and not to follow after your own heart and your own eyes, which you are inclined to whore after. So you shall remember. And do all my commandments and be holy to your God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. 
this word tassel and fringe is interchangeable. If, if you have a study Bible, it probably will even give you a cliff note that says that in, in the, the Matthew 14 verse. So the, the, the writer of Matthew and, and the people that would have been reading this first century would have knew immediately that, that when it talks about these people reaching out and, and for the fringe of Jesus' uh, robe would have been reaching for this. This tassel that was specifically designed for God's people to remember that Yahweh, that God, is their God. Now here's what's interesting about that. Over and over again what we see in Scripture, this, even what we see in Numbers 15, is that, man, this was something that was designed for just yourself. Moses said, hey, I, I want you to, to do this. I want you to put this on your clothing, not for anybody else. I want you to do it for you to remember my faithfulness, for you to remember what God has done to you, for you to remember that God is your God. And the reason we know that is, is Jesus in Matthew 24, he even condemns the Pharisees because what the Pharisees started doing, these are kind of the religious elite. They often wanted to be seen for their piety. They, instead of making these small little tassels for them to remember, they would make them as big as they could so that other people could see them. And, and it, they could show off to other people like, man, look how incredible I am, right? My tassel's bigger than yours, right? They, they got in this, this contest with, with, with other people, and Jesus condemned them for that. Said, hey, this isn't a practice that was designed for, for other people. It was between you and God. And so you have this, this group of people that whenever they're saying, man, hey, I want to grab your tassel. I know it's something between you and God traditionally, but when I grab that, I'm acknowledging that the testimony of Numbers 15, uh, the declaration of who our God is, when I'm grabbing it of you, Jesus, I'm believing in you as the coming Messiah. You're not there yet with me. Okay, I want, I want, to, I want to show you a little bit more on how cool this is. Ruth chapter 3. I know we're going in a lot of different places, but, but I'm giving you the context that the, that the Jews would have already had. Ruth chapter 3, uh, we can't get into the whole story of Ruth, but, but, but Ruth, uh, her, her husband, uh, her father-in-law, they, they've, they've all died, and she has said, man, I'm going to continue uh, to be near Naomi, I'm going to be with my mother-in-law, I'm going to take care of her, and she goes to a guy named Boaz as a kinsman redeemer, and this kinsman redeemer uh, it shows up this way. She she's went to him, and, and he says, man, who are you? She went to him in the night. He really got scared in this moment. This woman just showed up uh, in his room and says, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. That's a weird thing to say. I don't even understand the context of that. Why I'm showing you this verse over and over again in the Old Testament, this idea of, of spread your wings uh, is interchangeable with the corner of your garment. The corner of your garment was, was associated with identity in the Old Testament. And so Ruth's saying, hey, uh, this, this symbolic thing of you putting your, the corner of your garment, the, the wing of, of your clothing over me is symbolizing that, that hey, that, that I am with you. And so I wanted to give you context for the language and how things were used. Now I want to take you to Malachi chapter 4. This is the last place I'm going to take you. I know, I know we've been all over. Malachi chapter 4, this is the last chapter of the Old Testament. These are the last words that the, the followers of Jesus would have been hanging on to. Because between the Old Testament and the New Testament is 400 years of silence. We don't have uh, any scriptural writing in those times. The Lord was silent between the close of the Old Testament and the time of Jesus. So the thing that these individuals would have been holding on to is right here. Malachi chapter 4. It says, for behold. The day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. This, this prophecy of what's to come. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. That's where it really gets good. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in, his, in its wings. You shall go out weeping like calves from the stall. 
Man, this verse that, that the, the Jewish people have been holding on to about this coming Messiah, this coming Redeemer that isn't shown up yet, that they've been waiting for for over 400 years, that they've been longing for, this coming Messiah that was prophesied about in Genesis chapter 3, the beginning of the world. And now they hear about this guy named Jesus, and they said, man, if he is the Messiah, there's healing in his wings. There's healing in the corner of his garment. I need to declare that he is Messiah, and all i got to do is just put my faith and reach out and touch the fringe, touch the corner, the tassel of his garment. And the readers would have knew that, that these people weren't just getting healed by getting close to Jesus. It's, they were uh, declaring to a watching world that this is the Messiah we've been waiting for. This is the one individual that, that I need as Lord over all of my life. I don't need anything else. I don't need uh, uh, temple practices. I don't need to sacrifice a bunch of I need this guy. He is the Messiah we've been waiting for. That was just so incredible that, that God just, just, just allowed me to, to, to see some of that and just even step, uh, take a small step into to the, the eyes and mindset of the ancient Jews. And it's a moment I believe he's calling us into of saying, man, hey, hey stop trying uh, all your own remedies and all your own things to figure it out. Uh, stop putting your faith in anything else. We need Jesus and Jesus alone. Nothing else. Man, man, a lyric of a song that I've been listening to a lot recently has really stuck with me. This is the last line of the song. It says, and oh, I'm not here for blessings. Jesus, you don't owe me anything. More than anything that you can do, oh, I just want you. But more than anything that you can do, I just want you. If, if God, we, we accredit every good thing that's ever happened to us in our entire life to the Lord God Almighty. But if God didn't do a single thing from this point forward uh, for you and your life, would a relationship with him be enough? I believe it's just on testimony of our holy God that it is. Jesus plus nothing is enough. Now, I believe that God is going to work incredibly for you and do things in your life more than you could ever imagine going forward. But even if he didn't, even if he didn't, a right relationship with him is more than enough. Right, that we go back to Ephesians chapter 2 and when he says that, man, we are seated at the table with Christ. That, man, if, if we trust in that and we hold on to that, man, we can face anything that this world has to offer. Because as, as terrible as this world can get, the the, the as bad as it can be, pales in comparison of an eternity living right in a relationship with the Father. And he wants that for your life. And so here, here's what, what, what I think the, kind of the, the application, the, the, what I believe God's calling us to in this morning is to really take an examination. Man, have I put my, been putting my faith in anything else? Maybe I've even been putting my faith in like 99% in Jesus or 80% in Jesus, but, but I'm just still holding on to that 1% of whatever else just in case. God wants more for your life than that. God wants you to put your faith in him alone because it is through him. There is no other way to be made right with God. 
So I give us an opportunity this morning as we, we, we prepare to even respond, an opportunity to say, Lord, I forsake all other things. Lord, I need you and you alone because there is no other way. Maybe you even need to ask yourself the question, something I've asked the Lord a lot this week. Lord, show me. Show me the things in my life that I've chosen over you, that I've trusted and put my faith in over you, Lord. I even think back, if I, if I was back in that moment, would I, would I have reached for the tassels for the fringe of Jesus' garment? Or would I have said, man, I, I can get by with my home remedies, my, the medicine I've been given. I can get by with what I'm doing. I can, I can muscle through. And Jesus said, no, 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 you just need me. Nothing else will do it. I just invite you to respond whatever way you see fit. Let's pray.